and whenever you're ready. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started then. Um, so, uh, good afternoon again, everybody. Uh, you know, before we get started with our, our SPP uh, meeting, I just wanted to give a quick disclaimer uh, about today's meeting before we get started. So, uh, this WebEx call is being recorded and it may be posted on DOE's website or used internally. If you do not wish to have your voice recorded, please do not speak during the call or disconnect now. If you do not wish to have your image recorded, please turn off your camera or participate only by phone. If you speak during the call or use a video connection, you are presumed to consent to recording and to the use of your voice or image. So with that out of the way, um, just wanna welcome everybody uh, today and once again to our our, one of our information sessions with SPP. Uh, my name is Parker Wicks. I'm a supervisory public utility specialist at the Rocky Mountain region, and I'm gonna be your MC for today. And thank you once again for joining us uh, to learn more about the Southwest Power Pool Regional Transmission Organization. Uh, we have a full agenda today, and we had quite a, a turnout. We have about 180 people registered, uh, most of them who have hopefully had a chance to jump online here already. So we greatly appreciate your interest in this topic and in the future of WAPA. Uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started shortly. Uh, but before we do, I just wanna cover a couple of housekeeping items um, and, and about how today's meeting will work. If you were on our previous call, uh, we're gonna be using the same format that we did before. Uh, for those of you who weren't able to attend the previous meeting, as you've likely noticed, you're not able to unmute your phone or show your video today. Uh, once again, as I mentioned earlier, we have a, a large number of people joining us and we have a large amount of information to cover. So we wanna be, make sure that we're able to share all the information we have in the time allotted. Uh, WAPL is gonna continue to engage with its customers on this topic and provide opportunities for discussion. Um, so this meeting is, uh, is being held to ensure that we all continue to be on the same page and also to provide you an opportunity to continue to hear from SPP about their organization and the new member process. If you'd like to ask a question during the session, you can use the chat feature in, the, in WebEx. Take a moment to locate and open your chat box on the right side of your screen below the panelist list. Uh, in the drop down menu, make sure that uh, the addressee is all panelists. Uh, this will make sure that uh, we can all see your question as it comes in. So feel free to submit a question whenever one occurs to you, and we will monitor all the questions and answer them at the end of the meeting with any remaining time that we have. In order to maximize our time um, and, and during the question time, we're, we're gonna focus on questions about widely applicable to topics. If you have a question on your utilities or organization specific circumstances, you can submit it and we will forward your question to your respective region for later discussion. Uh, one thing we wanna note is that unfortunately, if you're having technical issues, uh, we won't be able to assist you today, but a recording of this presentation and the slides will be posted at the source in the next few business, uh, in the next few business days. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned, today's meeting is to provide some additional information uh, to the firm electric service balancing authority and transmission customers of the Colorado River Storage Project, Loveland Area Project, and Upper Great Plains West. Uh, SCP has, once, has joined us once again to provide detailed information on several topics, and the speakers from SCP will be focusing on operations, zonal constructs, and resource adequacy today. After they conclude their pr presentations, we will use any remaining time to answer questions at the end of the meeting today. So uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Megan Sever at SPP. Hi, Parker. Um, thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Megan Sever, and I am a communication strategist at SPP. Um, we're gonna kick off our meeting with um, zonal placement with Charles Locke. He is the Technical Director of Transmission Policy. All right. Thank you, Megan. Uh, we can move to the next slide, please. Yep. If, Lisa, if you'll just give me permission to share my screen, I'll pull those slides up. 
All right, Megan, you should be good to go. Thanks, Lisa. All right, Charles, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, SPP uh, was originally composed when it was formed as an RTO in 2004 of 15 transmission pricing zones, and each of those zones had just one transmission owner in it. Over time, uh, additional transmission owners were added to the zones, and as time went on, uh, and, and as a result of uh, some discussion and, and activity at FERC related to the placement of transmission owners in zones, Eventually, the SPP board endorsed a policy, or rather a process, uh, that would uh, govern uh, adding new transmission uh, owners uh, to our transmission pricing zones. I'm not seeing, Megan, a slide. Am I missing something? Can you see that, Charles? Are you seeing? Not, not yet. Let me see. Okay, here we go. Okay, something's starting to come up. Okay, <laughs> Sorry about very that. Good. Not a problem. So, SP SPP reviews uh, applicants uh, to become transmission owners and follows the process endorsed by the board uh, to place its uh, facilities in transmission pricing zones. One of the key uh, criteria that have to be met in order for facilities to be placed into uh, SPP transmission rates is for, for the facilities to meet the requirements in attachment AI. Essentially, attachment AI is the definition of what constitutes transmission facilities under the SPP tariff. And you can see the, the criteria summarized here. The facilities have to be above uh, a voltage threshold that excludes the transformer isolation equipment. For example, if a isolation equipment for a transformer uh, is is on the high side above that threshold it will be excluded from from the definition of transmission uh, because it's protecting a transformer that would not be defined as transmission uh, but in any event the voltage threshold currently in SPP is 60 uh, kv uh, the proposal currently uh, on the west side is for that threshold to be 100 kv so there's a bit of a difference there uh, but that's that's the, uh, the the threshold we would currently use uh, on the east side would be 60 kv also, the facilities have to be either non-radial, that is a looped configuration, or if it's radial, it has to be a multi-customer radial. And when we say multi-customer, we're referring to multiple wholesale customers on the radial facilities. Open loops are deemed radial, so if you have a loop configuration, but the, but the switch or the breaker is normally in an open position, then that would be considered a radial configuration for purposes of determining whether or not it's transmission. Interconnections between uh, transmission pricing zones or to another transmission provider are deemed transmission. Additionally, control and protection equipment uh, for facilities that are transmission, the control, the control and protection equipment also would be deemed to be transmission. A direct current ties owned by an SVP transmission owner uh, are deemed to be transmission. In addition, uh, there's a possibility that if an entity wishes to uh, have facilities below the threshold, below the 60 kV threshold, to be determined to be transmission. It can make an application to the state commission or to FERC either one, and uh, seek a, de a determination from the commission that those facilities uh, meet the requirements to be determined to be transmission. And there are some cases where that's been done, and facilities below 60 kV have been determined to be transmission. So those are the criteria in a nutshell. Uh, there is further detail in the tariff itself, but these are the, the summary points. Next, next slide. This is the uh, slide discussing the zonal placement process that was endorsed by the board in 2017. It's applicable to the integration of a potential uh, SPP transmission owner's existing facilities uh, that would have a resulting impact in zonal revenue requirements under Schedule 9 of the tariff. Schedule 9 is the, is the schedule under which uh, legacy facilities or existing facilities are recovered by transmission owners uh, through network rates. Also, it would apply to the purchase by an, a current SVP transmission owner of existing facilities that were not previously included in zonal revenue requirements under Schedule 9. It involves a four-stage process. Uh, first of all, we receive notification from the applicant transmission owner that they wish to place their facilities under our functional control and recover the cost of their rates. 
Uh, then there's an, an information exchange period in which information is provided uh, to SVP related to the facilities and the transmission owner. SVP then engages in an integration analysis, including a rate impact assessment, and that's uh, a 45-day period, uh, roughly. And then at the end of that 45-day period, SVP issues a notice to the potentially affected parties indicating that uh, there's an applicant transmission owner that wishes to place its facilities under the tariff and indicating that to those potentially affected parties that their rates may be uh, changed as a result of that integration. Uh, after that, then there follows a 45-day period, minimum period, uh, for the affected parties to negotiate with the applicant if, if there's a desire to do so regarding uh, any matters related to that integration. The data that's uh, provided uh, to support the integration includes the identification of the facilities, uh, the, the description of the, of the degree of integration of those facilities and operations in SPP and, and with transmission owners in SPP, the reliability and comparability of the facilities uh, to existing facilities in SPP, uh, the revenue requirements in this components, uh, loads served, uh, line miles, the number of substations, service area, and really uh, any other information that the applicant may deem, may deem uh, relevant uh, can be provided. At the end of the process, at, at, at the end of the second 45-day period, uh, a filing then is submitted to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to request inclusion of the facilities in SVP zonal rates. Next slide. Uh, in terms of these uh, criteria that SVP applies, uh, FERC has stated that placing the facilities in the zone is a case-by-case -case determination. There have been uh, some cases before FERC related to this, and FERC has made that uh, clear. The criteria applied by SVP in recent reviews include the following. Uh, to, to, to determine whether or not to place the facilities in a new zone as opposed to an existing zone, we look at whether the revenue requirement is less than a minimum, a minimum threshold uh, based upon a three-year average. And we do adjust that uh, minimum threshold over time depending upon uh, the, the change from year to year of the overall zonal revenue requirements of uh, existing transmission owners. Recently, that threshold has been around $13 million. We also look at the extent to which the facilities substantively increase the SVP regional footprint and also look at the nature of transmission service to serve load uh, prior to the facility's transfer date. And uh, the load there is referring to the load that is directly connected to the applicant's facilities. Next slide. So if we make a determination that a new zone is not uh, in order as, uh, based upon the criteria I just reviewed, if the, if the new zone will not be created, we then look at, to see what existing zone those facilities should be placed in. And we uh, base it upon the following criteria. Uh, the, the extent to which the facilities are embedded in the existing zone, the extent to which the facilities are integrated with the zone, and the nature of transmission service to serve load prior to the facility's transfer date. Uh, we make this determination and the, uh, the uh, filing with FERC is then based upon SPP's assessment, but ultimately FERC makes the determination as to whether the proposed zone placement is just and reasonable. SPP provides evidence uh, supporting its case, but ultimately the judgment as to whether it's just and reasonable is FERC's, not SPP's. Next slide. It's also important to be aware of uh, another process uh, that is not the same as placing facilities under SPP's functional control, but it is a process that can result in a degree of cost recovery uh, for a network transmission customer. The possibility exists that a, a network transmission customer owning facilities that are integrated uh, with the SPP transmission system uh, can seek to receive a credit on its uh, transmission bill uh, for, the, for the cost of those facilities. Uh, there's an offset uh, uh, on the Schedule 9 bill specifically. To qualify, the facilities must be integrated into the SVP transmission system as specified in Section 30.9. And among other things, the facilities need to qualify under attachment AI. Uh, it's important to know that there's no credit over and above the transmission customer's uh, network uh, charge amount. That is, there's no payment back to the customer. So if the, cust if the customer's charge, for, for example, is $100,000, 
uh, then the credit back to the customer can be no larger than $100,000. There's, there's no net uh, windfall back to the customer. The cost of the credit also is included in the zone revenue requirement uh, paid by all customers in the zone, including the customer itself. In order to effectuate a Section 30.9 credit arrangement, SVP must submit filings to FERC in order to set that up. Now we make modifications to the network integration transmission service agreement, and we also make uh, some modifications to attachment H, which is the attachment in the S under the SVP tariff uh, where we uh, locate the revenue requirements of transmission owners. And we have to include information there related to uh, these, uh, the amount of the credits. I believe that, that concludes uh, my slides. Let's, let's look at the next one just to make sure. All right, that does. Are there any questions at this point? All right, if not, I'll turn it back over to yeah. the Sorry, Charles, yeah, uh, no questions uh, so far. And just as a reminder, if you guys do have a question that pops up, uh, Please feel free to throw them in the chat, and uh, we'll 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 address them at the end of the the presentation today. So thank you. Thanks, Charles. Um, up next, we have resource adequacy with Chris Haley, a senior planning specialist at SBP. Hey, Megan. Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, Megan said, I'm Chris Haley. I'm a senior planning specialist in our resource adequacy department. And I know you've had a, uh, a presentation on resource adequacy at SPP in the past, but I think this, um, this uh, presentation is really focusing on really one specific area of our program, and that being uh, how we handle purchase power agreements um, in the resource adequacy program. So. Um, before we, we step into um, the actual uh, overview of the uh, power purchase agreement uh, tariff language, I did want to kind of take a step back and kind of give you an overview of who's responsible, um, the, the demand types that we have that feed into our, our program, um, along with capacity and, and power purchase types. So just really kind of giving you an overview um, of other pieces of the tariff requirements that for our resource equity program before we get into the specifics of the qualification and verification of power purchase agreements and how they're used. Um, so with that, Megan, I think you can go to the next slide. So Jumping into who's responsible for resource adequacy, the way we structured um, our tariff is we've identified an entity and, and we've, we've labeled them as the load responsible entity. It is a, a definition that's only used in our resource adequacy program, but an LRE um, is really an asset owner that has registered load in our market. And so uh, by really tying into um, the market from a registration perspective, we were really able to identify um, those members that have registered load in the market. Um, and then really what they, what, what the way the resource adequacy language is structured is they become responsible for complying with our resource adequacy requirement. Uh, which we'll define we'll we'll define as as the RAR as we as we move through this uh, for discussion's sake. Um, but they are really the entity that takes on the load serving obligation. They're the they're the entity that that has to carry enough capacity to meet uh, their load plus the planning reserve margin, which makes up um, our our resource hazard requirement. Um, Attachment AA does require uh, the LREs to maintain enough capacity to meet their load and, and planning reserve obligations, as, as I said already, but um, we're not intending to affect their obligations outside of um, the SPPBA. So um, compliance with our RAR um, is, is not to, admit, to affect in any way any obligation the LRE has in another um, BA that's external to SPP. So 
Um, this, this resource adequacy uh, requirement is only intended to affect that load within uh, the BA boundary. And there again, um, wanted to point out that the market participant is responsible to ensure LRE's compliance. So if you're familiar with the market and, and you may have had some background already, um, you, you, the, a market participant has asset owners registered under them in the market. And so you could have an, a market participant that is an LRE, um, or you could have individual LREs that are, that are registered under one market participant. So while the obligation lies with the LRE, ultimate, res, ultimate responsibility to ensure that the LREs are meeting the requirement falls back on the market participant that has those entities registered in the market. And I'll step through this, and if you've got any questions, feel free to stop me as we go through and we can, we can take those questions. So moving on to the next slide, um, we'll talk a little bit about a couple of the demand types. And where I feel like this is important is when you, when you look at the demand that's used for calculating um, compliance with the resource access requirement, um, we focus on the net peak demand, but you have to start um, with, you know, with the a peak demand type forecast before you can get into the net peak demand um, forecast as well. So I really, I wanted to give a little background here on the two types of demand that we have in our, our program that we, that we lean on and list. A peak demand and being the highest demand um, that includes transmission losses. Um, and then it also looks at any impacts that you might have uh, from non-controllable, what we, we categorize as non-controllable, non-dispatchable behind the meter generation. So that's generation that you, ne you don't necessarily have control over, but it's built into your forecast, your peak demand forecast. And then um, any demand response programs, um, you know, the projected impacts from those programs that you don't necessarily have control over. So if you think about anything that you might have from a contractual perspective, if you don't have control over it, whether it's behind the meter or uh, the main response programs, those are usually built into your forecast. So the peak demand, this is how we define peak demand for resource adequacy. And this is kind of the basis for um, beginning to pare down our demand forecast getting into the net peak demand. And keep in mind, these are forecasts that are submitted directly to us by the LREs. Um, so then you jump into net peak demand. Um, the forecasted peak demand uh, is, you know, that's where you start. And then you start taking in the, uh, kind of start subtracting out different areas. And in this case, it's the projected impacts of demand response program. Um, and, and these are really those demand response programs that are controllable and dispatchable. So these are programs that you, that you have contractual agreements on that you can, um, that you can show the impact, that you can, you know, basically show that there's a level of reduction that can be taken uh, based on the contractual uh, basis, and you can prove it. And because there is some language now um, in place that you have to prove that that demand response rent, uh, program can meet the level of reduction that you're submitting. And then also um, you can adjust to reflect the contract of firm power um, as specified later on um, in this slide as specified in section 8.2 of attachment AA. So uh, firm power is basically uh, saying that there's a, there's a seller to you or to that LRE that's supplying full contractual obligations to that load. And under our resource accuracy construct, that load can be moved to the other party that's supplying the full um, contractual agreement. So really, when you think about that, that's kind of energy capacity and uh, enough capacity to meet the plan reserve margin as well. And then, uh, as I said, the, the RAR is applied to each LRE's in, um, net peak demand. So I think that's where just laying in this groundwork for further discussion becomes critical to helping you understand how uh, from your individual perspective, how this would be applied. Now, keep in mind, what we're, what we're presenting today is, is looking at how we handle resource adequacy um, currently um, in the SPP East. And so this is just an overview of, of the tariff language as it exists today. The next slide. 
So this kind of breaks down uh, the two type of capacity and purchase power types that we have um, in, in our program. First being uh, firm capacity, and this this is the credited capacity of, of generating units or portion of units, whether it's contractual rights um, or even sometimes PPAs, adjusted to reflect you know those purchases and sales of capacity with another party. So whether or not you're you're selling or purchasing capacity, um, you know that that ref is reflected in your it's either an addition or subtraction to your firm capacity. And the key is, is that it's got to be deliverable firm transmission service to the load. So if you want, you know, if you want to uh, to be able to have enough firm capacity or you, you, you're you planning to have enough firm capacity to meet the load portion of your RAR, you must have firm transmission service uh, for that, that level of capacity. Um, and then firm power is the power purchase and sales that there again, deliverable firm transmission service. Um, and as I stated earlier, it's it's to serve the load with capacity, energy, and planning reserves. So, you know, when you when you think about a firm power uh, contract or construct, it's basically saying it's going to be there um, in the manner of firm capacity. So you're saying it's going to be, you know, it's comparable to to you delivering power to your own uh, load customers. Um, so it, there's there's a level of certainty there. Um, with those firm power contracts that is um, that's comparable to to basically your how you're supplying your own uh, load with your own resources. Next slide. So briefly touching on the qualification of capacity, um, and you can find this in section seven of, a, of attachment AA in our tariff. Um, before you step into, in our tariff, before you step into the qualification of power purchase agreements, there's that qualification of capacity section. And there's two pieces of this that are broken down in here that we're going to discuss today. There's several other pieces as well um, for capacity that can be used to meet SBP's resource adequacy um, program needs. But these are the two that we're focusing on in, co in correlation with the power purchase agreements. And again, it's firm capacity and firm power, but this is really talking about you've already designated these two resources. Now, how do you qualify them to meet the requirements of the program? So for firm capacity and firm power um, that, are, that are derived from resources internal to the BA, um, there's, some, there's some qualifications you gotta go through. The first one is to demonstrate the resources registered in the market or um, is a designated resource on the network integrated transmission uh, service agreement. So it's got to be a designated resource um, on the NHTSA. You've got to submit current operational capability tests. Um, those those, are, those uh, requirements are outlined in the SPP planning criteria and now even the SPP business practice. Um, and so there's, there's requirements uh, for testing that have to be met, whether annual or um, like for capability over five years. Then you've got to demonstrate that there's firm service uh, from the internal resource to the LRE's load. And um, that can be done uh, various ways. And keep in mind, um, the way firm transmission service is listed here is consistent with the tariff. It's lowercase firm transmission service. So we're not necessarily saying in the tariff that you've got to have SBP firm transmission service. We're saying that you have to demonstrate that there's firm service um, to the LRE's load. Uh, so there's a myriad of ways that that can be accomplished, and, and we do have several different avenues that we work through with various members to ensure that there's firm service in place uh, to the load. And then uh, the firm capacity and, and firm power from the resources external to the BA um, must demonstrate ownership or contractual rights. Uh, and then submit the operational test results per the requirements of the BA where the resource is located. So, you know, this is a little different um, being uh, from a testing perspective, being that we say you've got to submit current operational capability for SVP. That's due to the way we lay out our testing requirements, not necessarily understanding all the different requirements of BAs outside of SVP, 
we basically say you've got to submit the current operational test results per the requirements of the external BA. Um, and then you also have to demonstrate there's firm transmission service from the external resource to the LRE's load. And then the last point here is really just to make sure that we're not double counting capacity and that any capacity that's being used in another BA or resource accuracy construct is not being used to supply SPP, um, SPP's resource accuracy construct as well. So the last bullet there is really just to meant, meant to make sure that we're not uh, double counting capacity in two different BAs. Next slide. So this is where we get into the bulk of the uh, the, the power purchase agreement uh, requirements, and this is found in Section 8 of Attachment AA. Um, but I'm really wanting to focus on Section 8.2, 8.3, and 8.4, which is located on the next slide in this discussion. Uh, so, and I tried to throw some really high level <laughs> examples over here to the right, so hopefully they make sense. I didn't. I tried just keep them very high level with going into too much detail. But under Section 8.2, it says when, it, you know, power purchase agreement qualifies as firm power and the purchase and seller are both LREs. So basically your purchase and seller are within uh, the SPPBA and it's firm power. So keep in mind, firm power says you're supplying uh, energy capacity and planning reserve obligations. So in that, in that instance, the the load obligation is transferring from the purchaser to the seller. So the purchaser deducts the contract amount from its net peak demand, the seller adds that amount to its net peak demand, and therefore the responsibility to maintain enough capacity to meet the RAR um, transfers from the purchaser to the seller. And so that's that's reflected in the um, in the, the blue box there to the right, where basically you're saying, you know, purchaser LRE, LRE1 has 100 megawatts of net peak demand. The contract is for 10 megawatts, so the purchaser would deduct that 10 megawatts from their net peak demand. So basically now they're setting a new net peak demand of 90 megawatts, the seller adds it in, um, and so now they have 110 megawatts of net peak demand. So you see the, the shift um, to their their load obligation based on the contract amount. And then 8.3 uh, talks about when PPA qualifies as firm power and the seller is not an LRE. So the seller of that, that contract is outside of, in this instance, the SPPBA. So in that case, the purchaser, who is an LRE in the BA, cannot deduct the contract amount from its net peak demand. So they have to maintain the same level of net peak demand. Now, they still remain responsible for meeting that load um, that's being served by the agreement. What they can do though, is they can reflect the contract amount, in this case, 10 megawatts, plus the purchaser's PRM um, uh, obligation. So. When they do that, that becomes part of their firm capacity. So really, it just basically that 10 megawatts plus the reserve amount just becomes part of their generation portfolio. It, it would basically, when they submit it to the resource adequacy program, look like they own that capacity. Um, and there again, firm transmission service is, is only required for the contract amount. So the 10 megawatts in this case would have to have firm service um, and the, the planning reserve portion above that would not mean would have not have to have firm transmission service. So this is a couple of instances here in A2 and A3 when you've got purchaser and seller um, that are both in the BA and then you've got when the seller is not in the BA but the purchaser is. And then um, looking at the last slide here and I see we got a question that popped up. We'll cover this last slide and then we'll we'll jump to questions. In, in the last slide, um, we talk about 8.4. So this is looking at a different, uh, taking a little different twist They're saying when the PPA qualifies as firm power and the purchaser is not an LRE, but the seller is. So basically the purchaser is not within the SPPBA, but the seller is within the B, uh, SPPBA. So 
in this instance, the seller cannot include the purchase contract amount in its net peak demand. Um, the seller reflects the contract amount plus whatever PRM requirement is maintained outside of the BA as firm capacity. So it's a it's a it's a reduction to their uh, generation portfolio. There again, firm term service is only required for the contract amount. So just to be clear, stepping through the kind of the, the example over there, the purchaser is not an LRE, they're outside of the BA. Seller is, is an LRE, they're within the BA. You've got 100 megawatts of, of, of net uh, peak demand. That stays, the, the, their load stays the same. Now, what they would do is they would subtract the 10 megawatts plus whatever reserve requirement the purchaser has from their generation portfolio. So all that means is they have less generation to serve that 100 megawatts of net peak demand than they would have before that that um, they sold that contract. So um, those are I know I threw that out there quickly, but those are two those are the, really the three main points that I wanted to focus on um, when talking about the qualification verification of power purchase agreements. It's really when uh, just to recap, both sellers and purchaser in the, are LREs in the BA. And then you have a situation where the purchaser um, is an LRE, the seller's not. Then you have a situation when the purchaser's not an LRE and the seller is. So um, just wanted to cover those with you today and uh, take any questions that you may have um, around how power purchase agreements are currently handled in the, um, in the resource accuracy program today. Now, I do see a question that Joe had of, of uh, asking if I'm going to talk about the PRM study that SPP will do for the West. Um, and Joe, I, I think to answer that question, yes, we would have to do a study, but you know, there's, there's definitely um, some discussion that would have to take place before we get into that study process, of course. You know, we'd have to work on creating a study scope um, and that could, you know, we could use the basis of how we perform the PRM study in the East as, as kind of the foundation for that discussion. And then really um, dig into the specifics of where the differences are between the East and West and how we would need to assess those differences in the PRM study. So um, as far as I know, I, I don't know how much discussion has taken place about performing the PRM study or what even the time frame would be right now. Um, but the way I've understood it is that if this, you know, this continues to move forward is that we would begin probably next year scoping out, beginning to scope out a study for um, determining an appropriate PRM for the SPP West. So with that, I'll just turn it over and, and take any questions. And hey, Chris, this is this is Parker once again, and and uh, you know, uh, just to make sure we can get through all of our our information here, we're going to take the uh, the questions at the end. So, um, folks, once again, if you have if you have any questions, feel free to throw them up in chat. We're tracking them, and we'll we'll uh, compile the questions, and and we'll we'll work our way through them after we get through all the presentations. So, uh, just a quick reminder. Thank you. Thanks, Barker, and thanks, Chris. Um, up next, we have operations with Daniel Barker, or Daniel Baker. I'm sorry, he's the lead functional coordinator at SPP. Daniel, hey guys, uh, were you going to pass control to me? I can I can present from here. Yes, I think I think um, Lisa's doing that now. Hi, Dan. You should have control to show your slides. All right. You guys see a little bit what's on the screen here, SPP operations? Yes, thank you. All right, let me check one more thing. All right, all right. All right, so it has been a couple of weeks since we got to talk about this the last time. So I'm going to take a few minutes today to go over pretty quickly the uh, pre operating day activities. Uh, so we'll click through a couple of these slides fast, uh, just to refresh your memory on where we're at. Uh, and I've got the, I, I left the picture in here for the, uh, 
the overview of our operations floor. Always good to see that. Okay, so kind of jumping around, uh, there is some RUC reliability unit commitment stuff we're going to talk about, but just as a refresher for day ahead market, uh, what's going into day ahead market? So we've got our activated constraints, our flow gates, uh, the instant, instantaneous load capacity, any schedules to interchange transactions, uh, any commitments that we made out of that day ahead uh, or the multi day ahead or multi day reliability assessments, and any resource transmission outages, uh, and then of course virtual bids and offers. So the key takeaway here is that we run the day ahead market without load forecast. It's financial only, it's bid in, generation, and load. All right, so breaking down those inputs a little bit. Uh, looking at what you're going to see is your bids and offers, any of the multi-day commitments, confirmed interchange transactions. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about was the OR requirements. So that's our operating reserves, spend, sup, regulation. We put that in there. Uh, it, it's the planned, the, what we know about for system topology, taking into account those outages. And of course, any activated constraints or flow gates. So those are the lines that we, based on our studies, we anticipate being overloaded. So we're going to try to position uh, the day ahead or the financial market to uh, to solve around those as well. Uh, so that that goes into your day ahead market. Coming out of day ahead market uh, are your cleared offers. Uh, so that's resources getting that fixed financial position, that cleared offer uh, for energy, uh, cleared bids. OR for OR virtuals and uh, schedules are also getting cleared there. And of course, the day had market price. So all of this is a hedge for what's going to happen in real time. So quick review, uh, if we look at what the difference uh, when we talk about some of the RUC studies in a minute. So of course, there's always going to be self-committed resources going into the day ahead market. Uh, and then the black line here is the generation that day ahead market commits based on those uh, submitted offers, interchange, uh, et cetera. So then you've got the bid in load and you're trying to commit enough resources to get up to that value, I should say. Now, when actual data comes in or what the forecast is, we get closer to it. Uh, you can tell it's a little bit different than what the day ahead market saw for. Uh, so remember, the difference between that is what we make up in our day ahead RUC or in our RUC studies. That's the when we close the gap between the financial market, the day ahead market, and the reliability assessment. So this is what we actually plan on seeing. So that's what your the RUC studies are doing in that piece. Uh, again, there's the possibility that generation could be decommitted in RUC. That's not really a practice we see a lot. Uh, we're usually making additional commitments. So High-level overview of those RUC studies. So it's the multi-day reliability assessment. That's something we're doing uh, quite a ways out. Uh, day ahead RUC, and we're going to briefly talk about a little bit of intraday RUC again today and that short-term RUC. So there's four RUC studies. Uh, just a overview of day ahead RUC. It is uh, the it's to assess the capacity adequacy. Uh, so it's that bridge between what happened in the day ahead market. So there was no forecast, it was all virtual, or, or that it included virtuals. And when we go to the day ahead RUC, it includes our actual load forecast and we take out all the virtual players. So it's, it's truly to, to shore up, uh, to get to that reliability need for the next day. Looking at the RUC inputs uh, and output, it, the day ahead RUC is the offers, confirmed interchange. I won't read the whole list to you. But you can tell the big difference here is that we're using our midterm load forecast. So we're using the load that we actually believe is going to be there. There is no virtual uh, transactions or virtual players in this, and we're trying to make that, uh, that bridge between the two, uh, what happened in the day ahead market and what we're looking for in, for the next day. Uh, so what comes out of the day ahead rock, the point of the study is to get those additional resource commitments. Uh, and we'll touch on a little bit uh, some of that, uh, we call it the RUC philosophy. Sometimes if we have uh, resources with a short startup times, we'll wait and take those commitments as we get closer to that real-time horizon to make sure that what we're forecasting actually occurs uh, so we don't unnecessarily commit generation. Uh, so ID RUC, so this is that uh, shorter time window. We're looking at four-hour blocks here. 
it's running during the operating day uh, that we're going to be talking about for RTBM in a minute. But this is running and, and making assessments throughout, an, throughout the operating day, trying to find any of those shorter uh, lead resources. So maybe they have just a couple of hours startup uh, so we can wait and make those additional assessments throughout the day to decide if we still need it. Uh, okay, so looking at just how these blocks work out. So your first ID rock hits that four hour, it's, uh, it's running in a four hour window, four hour block, sorry, four hour window every four hours. Uh, and it's, uh, it, for these cases, we'll talk about it's running the remainder of the operating day. So it's looking at everything we've got for today, every hour, and deciding what capacity we think we need that we don't already have committed. Uh, and then you can see as we continue running those RUC studies, uh, we're kind of pushing that further out the remainder of the day. Uh, at, at some point, we actually have our ID RUCs run for the rest of today and then let them look ahead to tomorrow uh, just to close any gaps there. Uh, and that's what you see here on the bottom is that uh, ID RUC 5 and ID RUC 6 actually ran for the short window of today, but then also bridge tomorrow. So the ID RUC uh, analysis and commitment. So again, so we have this RUC philosophy where we're running uh, these studies, we're making some, uh, the operators make some judgment calls and, and analyze the inputs into the system and, and make a decision if that commitment that the study may be recommending can wait. Uh, do we, does it look like the load's actually going to peak at the same time that the study said? Uh, do we have additional units outages that we know are coming back? So they can make modifications, but uh, once they accept that uh, suggestion from the study, we say that the resource is added to the COP or the current operating plan, and then the uh, notifications are automatically sent to the market participants. So primarily, um, here's a key point, the RUC studies are primarily focused on running a SCUC, so a security constrained unit commitment. Their, their focus is uh, how much of the startup cost, what does it take to get the minimum amount of generation online? Uh, so the last thing we talked about, uh, when we uh, talked about the pre-operating day activities, I think we we maybe started to get into the short-term RUC or struck. Um, so what is this? So this is a more granular way of running our unit commitment studies, and it runs in 15-minute blocks. Uh, and so we'll look at the timing uh, about with that here in just a moment. But the reason you have it is because sometimes you have a lot of uh, less than one hour uh, or less than two hour start uh, resources that you might we can call them peaker units, something that you're going to uh, just be bringing on to cover one or two hours during the, the peak of your day. Uh, so this is the short-term RUC study or struck. If I, uh, if, I, if I say struck, I apologize. I'm trying to remember to, uh, to explain what these uh, acronyms mean. So looking at the, um, the process, so like I said, it runs every 15 minutes and it's looking out over the next three hours. Now, Part of one of the criteria for the struck or the short-term RUC study to recommend a resource for commitment is it has to be able to start up, achieve its mid run time, and shut down within the study window. So within that three hours, we're looking to make sure that these units can both start up, meet their mid run time, and shut down. Uh, if your resource can't do that, it's probably not getting picked up in a short-term RUC study. It's going to an ID RUC study, uh, which we talked about. Those are the ones that run every four hours. Okay, so we should be caught up from uh, what we talked about last week. So uh, today we're gonna focus on the RTBM. So RTBM is what we call our real-time balancing market. Um, and in the, R the RTBM is a five minute uh, granularity view of the system. So we're solving every five minutes for the next, uh, for five minutes in the future. Uh, and it's the intent of the, the RTBM is to reliably operate the grid to balance that real-time uh, demand and generation uh, while respecting constraints that we have identified on the system. Uh, it also clears our operating reserves. So it's the operating reserves is, that, um, is a set aside capacity, as you know, that we need for either regulation or spinning up. So some of those contingency reserves, we allocate those in. Uh, in the hourly studies that are, we're going to use for RTBM. Uh, but whereas we talked about the, the RUC studies, their focus was on the SCUC, Security Constrained Unit Commitment. Your RTBM studies are Security Constrained Economic Dispatch. 
So now we're, the, the focus of the study changes a bit, and it's trying to find the least cost solution to meet all of those requirements that you put in. And so we'll go into a little bit of detail uh, on what those things are and how they play out. Uh, but just remember, this is a high-level uh, overview, so there's always more to know uh, that we can get into if needed later. All right. Uh, so some of the RTBM inputs and outputs here, if we look at the, the block diagram here, so resource commitments. So this is the commitments that are in that COP or the current operating plan that we've taken from multi-day assessments, the day ahead assessment, uh, and the ID rocks that have run to this point, and also any structs that have run to this point or the short-term reliability unit commitments. So here's the fleet of resources we have to solve the problem. Uh, it takes real-time offers, uh, so the energy megawatt uh, or the, the price per megawatt that you're submitting for your real-time offer, all uh, NSI, so all the approved uh, schedules and transactions are coming into the system so we can meet that NSI. Uh, we have also have a regulation target, so the, the allocation or the amount of regulation that we know we need to carry for that hour uh, feeds into the RTBM study to be cleared. Uh, so any OR requirements as well, uh, so spin, sub, so those are mostly your contingency reserves. Uh, one of the other differences is now we're looking at RTBM, we're able to utilize our short-term load forecast. So while our mid-term load, load forecast is quite accurate, short-term load forecast is even more accurate. So you're, uh, you know, you're only looking five or ten minutes into the future for this study, so you have a pretty good idea based on your current, your actual load. Uh, how to adjust that for five minutes in the future. Uh, so current resource output, we're taking ICCP data from all of the resources that are already in, uh, that maybe have been dispatched in the previous interval, and we're going to decide where are they currently at, where are they going, and if that's, if you're going uh, to X, here's where you can go for that next five minutes. We have to make an assumption of where you're going to be, and we'll talk about why that is next. Uh, and then also, uh, for the flow gates, so we can manually activate constraints, or there's a concept where they can auto activate once the loading gets to a certain percentage. But so it's a security constraint, which means that we're respecting those transmission uh, constraints if they exist. Uh, and then it's also an economic dispatch. So what's the least cost way to achieve uh, and to meet our load and our obligation for NSI? Uh, so coming at R2BM, um, we'll try. I'll try to keep these separate. So R2BM comes up with a dispatch dispatch instruction. Uh, that's the energy target uh, for each one of the resources. Uh, cleared operating reserves and real-time prices. Uh, later when we talk about what's communicated to the participant, we'll talk about set points. Uh, and there is a slight difference between what we talk about as dispatch and what we talk about as a set point, and we'll cover that in a moment. So looking at the timing, uh, so again, if we're looking at this one o'clock interval here, um, the short-term load forecast, we actually, at 1 o'clock, are looking out 10 minutes into the future. So why are we looking out 10 minutes? Well, it's going to take uh, some time between 1 and 105 for us to actually solve this, uh, to solve the study. Uh, so at 1 o'clock, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to grab the resource data. Uh, so this is where the resources are currently at. And we're going to grab a current topology model, so that state estimator solution. We bring that into the system as well, so we know here's the current uh, topology of the system, the current status of lines. Uh, and so once we have all of those inputs into the system, uh, between that 1 and 105, we're actually solving the study. Now, it usually takes two or three minutes. It doesn't take the whole five uh, minutes to solve it, but we give ourselves that window of time uh, just in case. Uh, and then it gives the operators a, a couple of minutes to look at that solution that comes out before they approve it, uh, just in case there was erroneous data that made it in there. Uh, so again, so between 1 and 105, we're solving uh, the economic dispatch, and this is going to be for interval 110. Uh, so at 110, this is our target. That's what we're going to. Uh, and what we'll see here in a moment, that if we solve the study between 1 and 105, we're actually able to, we have the dispatch instructions for interval beginning 105. So that's, uh, we're ready to let the participants know, here is where you're going uh, to meet your target, where you need to be at 110. 
So I know that that timing is somewhat confusing. Uh, you're getting a set point at 105 that tells you where to be at 110. Uh, and that may be intuitive uh, for, a lot of, for a lot of you, but I know it can be tricky to think about. You have to kind of leapfrog over yourself uh, to make these targets work out so that the system moves in a fluid manner. Um, so then, you know, obviously we, we've got real time prices, clear to wire dispatch instructions, all of that gets communicated. Uh, you actually get an XML signal at 105 to let you know this is where you should be headed for the next five minutes. Uh, so we're assuming everyone's going there uh, by 110, or that's where you'll be. Uh, if we look at how the process goes uh, for the next interval, so at, at 105, we're looking out at 10 minutes in the future. So now we're looking at the 115 time uh, frame. Where is load going to be? Uh, we're going to grab more resource data. The system conditions uh, also schedules everything we need to solve that 115 interval, uh, and we're going to start solving again. Now, one thing I'll mention here real quick is that we actually know where you're going to be at 110 because we told you that five minutes ago at 105. So part of our algorithm takes into account that you're moving towards your last dispatch. So we don't assume that you're at uh, the, where we snap or where we're picking up your resource at 105 uh, because we know you're moving to somewhere that we told you to go at 110. So we call that achievable target logic, but we know where you're going. Uh, so we're going to take that real-time data to say where you're at and assume you're following uh, and you're moving at your ramp rate to go to that last place we told you to. Uh, so moving back up here, so, so the RTBM is solving from 110, uh, solving for the interval 110 to 115 uh, is solving, uh, and then, you know, it's going to, it finishes at that 110 mark. You get more new a new five minute real time price, clear to OR and dispatch instructions, and maybe this time, uh, maybe this plant's being told to go down those five megawatts. Uh, so we assume you were going to the 30 megawatt target here, and you're going down to 25 uh, for the end of interval 115. Uh, again, I know that's somewhat confusing, uh, but hopefully that makes some high level sense about how the the timing is going to work out. Uh, between RTBM, uh, the way we solve every five minutes, but have to look ahead uh, 10 minutes into the future to decide where we need to be. So the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, functionally how our systems are laid out and how this, uh, how this interfaces with the participants. So the two block diagrams I have on the screen, one, the first one over here on the left represents our EMS, so it's our energy management system. One of the applications that, that runs within EMS, we, we affectionately call RTGen, real-time generation, and that is our AGC software. Uh, in the blue box on the right, uh, what's labeled Market Operating System or MOS, uh, and then within the Market Operating System is the MCE, Market Clearing Engine. So that's the software that's running these studies. It's running those RUC uh, studies. It's running the RTBM. Uh, all of that is happening happening in, in this, in what we call the MCE engine, uh, which is really just a software package, right? So uh, the day ahead market, reliability unit commitment, RTBM, all of that is running uh, inside MCE. Now the database, our market database lives in the MOS system or the market operating system, and so does uh, our CRD tool. Uh, and I'm probably in future discussions, we can get into contingency reserve deployments and how those work. Uh, so, how does this interface with you? So, as the market participant or the asset owner, one of the primary things that you're sending to support RTBM studies is ICCP data. Uh, so, one of the first things that we're looking at from a market participant is, if, for example, your control status. Is your unit able to follow set points? Uh, so, this, this first communication path here is us getting that uh, via ICCP, it feeds into our real-time generation or our AGC system to let us know, should we be echoing this resource uh, or are they able to follow our instructions? Um, next, uh, that snapshot data. So in addition, we're getting your real-time megawatt uh, for, for the, each resource. And what we call a snapshot uh, is when we take the uh, basically a picture, take a snapshot of what your control status is and what your real-time megawatt value is, 
and we, we send that over to the market system to begin solving the RTBM uh, case. Uh, in addition, so through the portal, uh, market participants interface and you enter your resource, your energy offer data. So that's your price per megawatt. So MOS will also get all of that data that's current uh, to begin solving the next, five, you know, the five minute solution. Uh, so taking this data, um, what, when we finish solving, so remember when that five minutes is over and we've, we've actually got the solution, we finish solving for the next five minutes, there is an XML message that goes out to the market participants to let them know uh, here is where you're going in the next five minutes. Uh, in addition to that XML, so number three is an XML message that's being sent across uh, and also any cleared OR that each resource may have. In addition to that, uh, our RTBM solution, uh, the real-time balancing market, communicates to our AGC software, uh, both our dispatch and any cleared OR uh, or operating reserves. So that dispatch is, is what's needed to meet our energy target, and then the OR could be spin, sup, or regulation. Uh, inside of our AGC software, then, we do we perform the four-second uh, to four-second real-time balancing. And if needed, we can make adjustments uh, to this dispatch. And so I talked about it earlier that there's a slight, uh, there's a distinction between dispatch and set point. And that's because when our AGC system, or RTGen here in the diagram, if it knows that uh, a resource is going to 100 megawatts to meet its energy target, the, the formula for set point is equal to your energy dispatch plus uh, any CR that we've deployed plus any regulation. So uh, in particular, AGC, our RT Gen software is performing that AGC function for us. And if we needed four megawatts of reg up on your resource, then the actual set points you get would be that 100 megawatts for energy plus four megawatts for regulation. And so the set point instruction is gonna come back to the participant uh, as 104 megawatts. And that's ultimately what we want you to follow is the set point instruction. Uh, and so there, there's a clearing price in everything. You're compensated for clearing that regulation, uh, but based on the balancing needs of the system, we're calculating a set point, uh, which is just, it's different than dispatch. Dispatch only meets energy. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Okay, so what is, what's the main thing that we're, we're dealing with five minutes to five minutes uh, in operations? Well, that's gonna be congestion. Uh, so congestion, or we call them flow gates, uh, so it's the bottlenecks on the system. Uh, it's a, a transmission limitations most likely. Uh, so there's either a current flow that exceeds uh, a, a limit or a rating, or there's a potential, an N minus one constraint uh, that will exceed a, uh, a known uh, system limit. So we feed those into the market to find a least cost solution to dispatch around those. Uh, congestion can be caused by any number of things, right? So uh, it could be tra transmission. Uh, what we saw just this past winter uh, was generator outages, right? That played a big role in causing congestion on the system. Uh, unplanned outages, storms, trees, uh, too much generation in one location. I think we've seen that in some places where there's a, a large collection of wind isolated in one area and it's hard to get that wind out of that area sometimes. Uh, so that would be an example of a, we have a flow gate to control that, uh, to limit the amount of wind we dispatch out of that zone if it's congested. Um, so all of this uh, are examples of congestion. And this is probably, you know, when you're looking at a security constrained economic dispatch, uh, these are your challenges uh, that you're, you still have to meet your known obligations so that you're loading your NSI, uh, but you have to do so within these constraints. So we're going to cover a few definitions here uh, and then talk about some high level uh, explanations of how some of the formulations work. Uh, so the first definition we've got is flow gate. So I, some of you may not be familiar with that term. Uh, again, flow gate is what we use. Uh, to talk about uh, congestion. So it's a transmission facility or transmission element that's been identified as limiting the amount of power that can be reliably transferred over the bulk of transmission system. In other words, uh, limit, limit uh, uh, this element for the loss of another one because if, if it happens, 
uh, we have a potential SOL violation. Uh, so we build these flow gates to identify those and, and feed them in as a constraint to the market. One of the things that we need to calculate is a shift factor from each injection, uh, so generators, uh, to these known uh, constraints. So how much does your generator impact a constraint? Uh, we calculate that and that the result is a shift factor. Maybe you have 50% shift factor to a constraint, which would be pretty high. Uh, so it could also be calculated, uh, there's a GLDF calculations we do, uh, where you look at the impact of gen to load, uh, where you can look at the impact of load to a, to a flow gate. But all of these are, are what uh, we call shift factors, uh, and it's, it's a mathematical calculation of impact. So one of the other things, one of the other terms we need to discuss is shadow price. So shadow price is a financial calculation. It's a financial uh, uh, a financial method of a way to express how much the congestion changes the economic dispatch on the system uh, or how much it costs to reduce the flow. That's a good way to put it. Uh, so how much did that congestion cost versus a system that was not congested at all? And we'll look at an example of, of shadow price in a moment. So again, the uh, market clearing engine, MCE. So this is the optimization-based application. And so the, the two algorithms that we talked about were SCUC and SCED. SCUC being primarily what's used in those RUC studies, and it's the security-constrained unit commitment, uh, and then SCED being the security-constrained economic dispatch. Uh, again, so we talked about SCUC. It's, it's an algorithm to determine which units need to be committed. It's looking at startup costs. Uh, minimize the startup cost, get me enough capacity on the system to meet my anticipated demand. Uh, it is not concerned uh, necessarily with economic dispatch, uh, as opposed to economic dispatch, which is looking at, based on the units that are already committed, uh, what is my most economic way to dispatch those resources and also meet uh, my obligations, so my known load and my NSI. Uh, it does this uh, through an application uh, or through a concept called linear programming. And so what are we doing with linear programming? What does this mean? So it's a way we can feed a software application those goals. Uh, so in the case of a security constrained economic dispatch, the goal is least cost generation. Uh, feed it that goal and the constraints. Uh, and so if we look at the uh, a linear programming problem, it gets bro we can break it down into these three primary uh, uh, areas. So the objective function, we're trying to minimize the cost uh, to serve, minimize the cost of energy, find the least cost solution. Constraints, uh, these are the things that get fed into MC says, well, don't violate these. And that could also include congestion that's been identified on the system. Uh, you can, uh, and we'll look at an example in a, in a moment of how congestion can impact dispatch, but uh, the linear program, linear programming allows you to take the objective function, all of these constraints, and any decision variables, and that would be, uh, for example, the dispatch that we can give to one unit versus the other. It can solve all of this all at the same time. So it does that, it's a co-optimized solution is another way that we put that. Uh, so we can take all of those things at once and come up with the least cost, most reliable solution uh, to meet our known obligations. All right, so how do we do that? So one of the ways that we do this is that we calculate an LMP, or so it's locational marginal pricing. Uh, so this is a financial representation of, of that linear programming. Here's the price at each node on the system. Uh, the LMP decomposes into three basic uh, terms here. So the MECs, that's the marginal cost of energy. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, the MLC, so the marginal loss component. Uh, this part can be somewhat tricky to explain, but it's essentially a way for us to represent that although uh, the least cost generation may be very, very far away from the load, we take into account that you're going to have losses on delivering that power over a long distance. 
Uh, so that changes the effective price to get the energy from that resource. It, it accounts for losses on the system. Uh, and the last piece is that MCC, so that's the marginal congestion cost, uh, the marginal congestion component. Uh, so basically that is the cost of congestion. How much, and that's the difference between a non-congested system and the fact that there is congestion, what changes we had to make uh, to accommodate. And we'll look at an example of that in a moment. Uh, we talked about shift factors earlier. Shift factors are a primary component that we'll discuss about MCC, or that marginal congestion cost. Uh, to determine how much the marginal congestion cost is for a particular resource or node, uh, so a resource exists at a node, uh, so when we calculate the locational marginal price for that node, we need to know uh, what shift factor your resource has uh, on a known constraint, and so we'll take the shift factor and the shadow price of that constraint and calculate this marginal congestion cost. Uh, and that changes your, ultimately the price at that, look, at, that, uh, at that node. And so we can look a little bit more in detail here on shift factors. Uh, so again, it's that how much does impact uh, does that injection withdrawal have on the node cause on a flow gate? So we talked about generation uh, needs to get uh, to the load, obviously. If that path is constrained, we will have defined it as a flow gate. And so in this case, we're, we're just calling it flow gate Y. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to calculate how much impact uh, this flow gate has on the amount of generation we would have taken uh, from A to B. Uh, and so we'll talk about that uh, with a couple of examples uh, in a few moments. Uh, for shadow price, uh, so the MEC, uh, is the shadow price of balance and power. That is the, uh, it's the cost of generation uh, taking into account uh, those offers that uh, the real time offers. Uh, and then the shadow price is also going to be what we talk about as a subcomponent of the MCC. So uh, how much does, how much did that uh, congestion cost? And so we can, we can probably look at a few examples and this will make a little more sense. So looking at uh, the impact of shadow price. So in this example, we've got generator one has a 250 megawatt max and $6 per megawatt hour. Uh, this generator is good for 150 megawatts. Generator two has a 250 megawatt max and is priced at $10 a megawatt hour. So between this two bus system, uh, we've defined a flow gate and given it a limit of 150 megawatts. Uh, so in this case, if we look at a, a load that exists over on the right-hand side, a 200 megawatt load, the most economic uh, way to dispatch this is going to be uh, taking uh, 150 megawatts uh, from generator one at $6 plus 50 megawatts uh, from generator two, and that's at $10. Uh, so the total cost of the system is $1,400. Uh, now, and this is, these are just high level two bus examples, but when we're looking at, if we want to know what impact this limit had, uh, this flow gate had on this dispatch. So if we could only dispatch generator one uh, to 150 megawatts, what, what if we could dispatch generator one to 151 megawatts? Uh, that would be the marginal impact to this constraint. So let's look at that. Uh, so if we raise in, in the calculation, if we increase the transfer limit on this flow gate to 151 megawatts, the system can now resolve and decide what that total cost difference is. Uh, so the new cost is going to be $6 times 151 megawatts from generator one uh, plus $10 times 49 megawatts from generator two. So your total cost becomes 1396 uh, and your shadow price then is the difference it's 1396 minus the original 1400, uh, and that gives you a $4 shadow price. So that was the cost of this congestion. Uh, hopefully that uh, makes sense. Uh, and what it is doing is putting a financial price on the economic dispatch uh, due to this constraint. So if we look at LMP, uh, we're gonna look at a little different example. Uh, so if we want to see what the LMP looks like just when there's no congestion on the system. So again, generator one, 250 megawatt max, 
uh, $6 a megawatt hour. Generator 2, 250 megawatt max, $10 a megawatt hour. Now you've still got the 200 megawatts uh, of load on the second bus on the right. So essentially, generator one, uh, if this is an uncongested pass, uh, is going to be paid. And so we're going to dispatch the full 200 from here. So that's $6 times 200 megawatts is $1,800 in revenue. Uh, and then the load, uh, the LMP, so that would be the same at both buses here. The LMP for the load is going to pay that $6 times 200 megawatts. They have an $1,800 cost. Uh, notice it is, it's net zero. Uh, and so, because of this, this is a balanced system with no congestion. Uh, this is it, the easiest example to look at. Uh, now, we had some good questions in the past, and so the next slide, uh, it, it was not in your original packet that was sent out. I added it uh, after that was uh, set up, but uh, I think you're getting a supplemental uh, packet that will have this next slide. Uh, it introduces a concept that you may not have, uh, have looked at yet. Uh, so, if we look at an LMP, the impact, and we're back to this example with congestion, if we looked at the impact of congestion on a simple two-bus model, uh, th there's a couple of things to note here. So, again, we, we're back with our flow gate Y. The transfer limit is 150 megawatts. Uh, so, we can only dispatch generator 1 to 150. So, the settlements for this is $6 times 150 megawatts. They have $900 in revenue. Generator 2, uh, as in when we looked at a few minutes ago, gets dispatches the remaining 50 megawatts. So they're going to be paid the $10 times 50 megawatts for a $500 revenue. So why are those two different? Well, that's because if we skip, and we'll just look at the bottom uh, gray box here, Generator 1's LMP is going to be equal to the MEC, so the marginal energy cost. The next megawatt would have to come from Generator 2, so he sets price. Uh, the marginal price for the system. So he does have that $10 MEC, but if you'll notice, there's also the negative $4 MCC component. So there's a congestion cost applied to that, uh, to generator one bus. Now, uh, again, this is a simple two bus model. Uh, what, in a fully integrated system, these are a lot more complicated, but uh, in this example, it's easy to see where the impact of that MCC would land. Uh, so it goes squarely on generator one. Generator two, on the other hand, has no uh, impact, uh, and so he has no constraint cost, MCC. So he's getting the MEC cost, uh, which is why there's a difference in what they're being paid. Uh, now, the load, on the other hand, pays MEC. So they're going to pay uh, $10 times the 200 megawatts, so there's a $2,000 cost. So where does that extra money go? Uh, and that was the question that we got in a previous presentation, uh, which the answer is in a, in a large system, you don't expect to see this uh, as uh, defined as it is in this two bus model. But if this was reality, that $600 gets paid back to the TCR holder. So TCR is probably a new term uh, that you guys may not be familiar with, but it's a, it's a congestion rights uh, allocation. So this may be a constrained path and there is, there's a TCR auction and there's a whole uh, separate presentation we could do on TCRs and ARRs. But uh, essentially someone else has, someone has holds the rights to congestion and they get paid when there's congestion on that, they get paid that, uh, that difference of what's collected versus what's paid. Uh, so again, really high level example on these, uh, on these concepts and uh, and it's somewhat easier to look at in a three to five bus model, uh, but also more complicated to follow the math. Uh, so keep in mind, simple two bus model, uh, but the concepts hold true. All right, so we're, we're getting close to wrapping up here. So LMP uh, decomposition again, so we talked about it. Uh, it's the uh, LMP is equal to your MEC, so your marginal energy cost, plus your MLC, marginal loss, uh, cost. So, how much does the energy cost by itself? How does the impact of how far away or, or the lossiness of the system impact it? Uh, and then the last thing is the MCC, which is the marginal congestion cost. What impact does that generation have on a constraint? So, looking at these uh, in some terms that we just talked about. So, MEC, so that's pretty easy. That comes straight from your offer data. Uh, and the 
MLC, the marginal loss component, is your loss sensitivity uh, times your MEC. And then the shift factor times shadow price, the sum of all your shift factors times shadow price of all the constraints that unit impacts. Uh, so again, we're solving a co-optimized solution. So it's not one constraint, it's every constraint in the system. Uh, so you may help one hurt another, that, and maybe those shadow prices uh, would balance each other out. But your total impact to all defined constraints, shift factor times shadow price, is where you get your MCC component, or your marginal congestion cost. Uh, the last formula that I've got for you here, uh, you may have this for the test. Uh, so your LMP is uh, MEC divided by uh, the, the partial derivative of your losses. Uh, times your MEC times the sum of your shift factors to any shadow price of those K constraints uh, that may have been defined. Um, so from there, I don't believe I've got anything else today. Uh, hopefully, if you guys have questions, put them in the chat box. Uh, we, I'm sure we can come back to them, uh, or if, if need be, we can set up another uh, uh, more detailed uh, discussion if it's in a particular area that we couldn't get into the details today. Uh, I believe I'm going to turn it back over here. Parker, are you there? You're muted, Parker. And you have control of the yep. slide now. As, <laughs> as per usual. Awesome, thank you. Um, all right, well, uh, get my screen up here. I just want to, uh, you know, say quickly, you know, thank you uh, to to SPP. Thanks, Megan, um, Charles, Chris, and Daniel for for going over that information and walking through it uh, with us. Um, looks like you know we have about thirty minutes for questions. Uh, we had a couple come in. Um, that I want to touch on uh, real briefly, but just uh, you know, go ahead and submit any questions that you have in the chat box now, and we'll work to address them. Um, just as a quick reminder, because we have a large and diverse group uh, on the the call today, we're going to focus first on wild uh, the the widely applicable questions. If there are questions about your specific circumstances, you can submit it, and we'll forward it to your respective region for later discussion. Um, so, uh, let me just kind of go through some of the questions that we have received so far. Um, and just one second. All right. So, uh, the first, the first question, um, you know, that we, we got was, uh, from, from Joe Taylor and it was just a question, uh, about, um, uh, you know, the PRM study and, and Chris obviously answered that already. Um, then we also got a question, uh, about whether or not, uh, there's a glossary of sorts, uh, for all the SPP acronyms. Uh, so, um, just uh, open it up to, to SPP and see if you guys could uh, direct all everybody in the right direction to see the uh, find the glossary. So I'll go. <laughs> Um, I don't know that we have a, a glossary that we could point you to, but in the slides from today's presentation, um, when we do first reference of a term, we try to spell it out with the acronym following. So when you get a chance to look at those slides, which we'll be sending um, after the presentation, um, you'll be able to tell what is what. Um, I can try to put something together to send with that, that kind of puts all of those on one page to make it a little bit easier. And this is okay. Charles Locke. I might mention that uh, for the terms that are uh, in the tariff, of course, you could you could look in there. Uh, the the SAP Open Access Transmission Tariff is posted on our website, as well as the market protocols. The market protocols would contain 
a lot of the uh, acronyms that uh, Daniel was using. Uh, so those are a couple of valuable sources. I don't know that we have a single source of all the acronyms, as Megan indicated, but at least those would be two sources you could you could try looking at. Okay, great. Um, appreciate that. And then you know the second question that that we got is uh, was from Joe, um, and uh, just in regards to you know is this the second meeting, uh, and if so, where was the recording uh, posted for the the first one and. And it is the, the second meeting. We held our first meeting on May 20th. Uh, for those uh, of you who, who weren't able to attend that, you can you can find uh, Rebecca posted the the link to the video and the recording in the chat box there. So you can you can find uh, you can just follow that link to be able to take a listen to that first recording if you're interested. All right, um, and Lisa, I can't see the chat box. Uh, real quick, let me just see if we have any more come in here. We don't have any more questions right now, Parker. All right. Well, we'll, we'll give folks just a, a couple of minutes. Um, if you have a question, please go ahead and, and uh, just drop it in the, the chat box um, and we can, we can try and address it. Um, and then, you know, while we have uh, folks maybe Getting to that, I uh, just want to mention that WAPA has this this website here uh, that you can go to uh, to to get you know some updates on any of the documents or the meeting materials uh, for you know, these meetings and the the SPP RTO membership in general. Um, so we'll send out the, the slides and so you can. You know, you can take a look at that link if you need to check on anything. Thanks, Parker. Thanks right. for still alive in the chat. Um, had a, a couple of thanks for the session, so you're very welcome. I believe we plan on having an additional session to talk about more details on the SBP organization. So keep staying in touch for that. Yeah, yeah. If there if there are no other questions, you know, uh, once again, just uh, thank everybody for your time. We really appreciate you coming out and uh, being engaged in this process and in the discussion. Um, and we'll continue continue the discussion uh, as we move along here. Thanks, SPP, for your time for for joining us and providing all this great information.